In our previous video, we went over an overview of async task and how we can make threading in the Java programming language. In this video, we're going to start to implement the async task in code. First, let me give you an idea of what we want to do, a business case. What I want to have happen is when I start typing Eastern Redbud, let me just uh, rotate just a moment, there we go. When I start typing Eastern Redbud, I want it to autocomplete from a list of all of the plants that are available on plantplaces.com. Now this information is available over a JSON feed. So you see right now if I type Eastern, it doesn't autocomplete. It doesn't give me any options that begin with Eastern. But indeed, there are several plants that contain the word Eastern, as we see from this JSON stream. You see, I can put in Eastern, I can put in Western, I can put in English names, I can put in Latin names, whatever I want. And this is going to respond with a set of data that matches uh, whatever I've put in. So we want to eventually be able to connect to this stream and parse the results. We're not going to get there yet. Right now, our focus is just on making a threaded call so that we can make a network call out and eventually get to the data you see here. So the screen that we're looking at is actually the G this screen right here is the GPS of plant screen, which corresponds to this GPS of plant activity. I'll be doing most of my work in the GPS of plant activity, so I'll just put it into presentation mode. And the first thing that we're going to do is create an inner class. So an inner class is a class within a class. If you get a little confused on the steps that I'm going through here, remember I went through them in the previous video, which was an overview video. So first of all, I put my cursor on the close curly, and that should match up with the open curly of the class itself, GPS of plant, which extends plant places activity, all the way up on line 45. Remember why we're doing an inner class. We're doing an inner class because we need to extend from async task. And a class can only extend from one other class at a time. So our activity itself is already extending from plant places activity. If we need behavior that we want to inherit from a sync task, we have to create an inner class that will do that inheritance. The most important watch out here is just be careful where you're creating the inner class. Make sure you're within the enclosing class and not within another method in our case. So right out here, I'm going to say class plant search task extends async task, like so. Now, note that we're going to have to have some generic identifiers here. And if you take a look at the, the hint that comes up above, it gives us some ideas of what these generic identifiers are going to be. One is, what are the parameter types that we're passing into the thread? Next, what's a progress indicator that the thread can report to say, hey, I've reached this stage, I've reached this stage. Finally, what is the result that will be returned when the thread is finished? So I can tell you I've done this before, so I have some answers predefined, but I'll just talk you through them right now. We're going to accept a string. That makes a lot of sense because if you think about that autocomplete that we just took a look at, I was entering text data, which would be a string. Secondly, for the, uh, for the progress indicator, it's almost always an integer. We have to use the, uh, the class integer, the uh, wrapper class called integer. Not the primitive, though, because this is a generic, and for generics, we have to use classes. Finally, the result. We'll think again about that JSON stream that I showed just a few minutes ago. That is going to ideally return to us a list or a collection. But now here we have something interesting because list has a runtime generic dependency. Async task has a compile time because you see we're writing this in code and it's going to compile. But for list, we have to tell it what it's going to carry. Well, I believe a while ago we made a class called plant DTO, which represents the nouns of a plant, uh, the plant genus, species, cultivar, common, and so on and so forth. So first, let me alt enter, take care of this, alt enter, take care of a couple of imports, then open curly and close curly, and let's just remember what plant DTO is. I control click into here, it's a simple Java bean, a simple POJO, something that has private attributes and then public getters and setters, a similar concept that we've seen before. So essentially what we want to do is just take this stream of data and convert it to one of these plant DTO objects, or actually each line that you see here from 2 to 17 will be its own plant DTO object. That's our end game. Okay, back to GPS of plant then, because I do have a red line and we know when we have a red line, we need to stop and fix it. So a little bit of alt enter, and it's telling me that I need to implement methods. Now that typically only happens when we implement an interface 
or when we extend an abstract class and we have abstract methods that we need to deal with. So here I'm going to say uh, implement methods and OK and take a look at the method that it implemented. It implemented the method called do in background. And what's really interesting is look at the return type from this method and also look at what's getting passed in. So a string is getting passed in and guess what? That matches our first generic identifier. And do in background is returning a list of plant DTO objects and that matches our third generic identifier. Now this is really interesting because we know that do in background is an abstract method because we had to implement it. Abstract method means it's more than likely defined in this class called async task. So this class async task was written long before I ever wrote this program, but somehow the do in background method knows it has to return a list of plant DTOs. And there's the value of generics. You see that return type is left until we extend this class and we specify what return type we want the do in background method to have. Really neat stuff. So back to our presentation, we know this is one of our important methods because we know that do in background is what runs in a separate thread and the return type for this is what gets passed to on post execute. On post execute operates back in the UI thread. And so let's work with on post execute. For on post execute, okay, take a look. What type is it receiving? It is receiving a parameter type of plant DTO, which is the return type from do in background. So a few things we need to do here. Eventually we're going to need to work, walk out to a networking class, which is going to grab that JSON stream and bring it down for us. But at the moment, we don't know how to do all the networking. So we are just going to say, we're just going to start stubbing some things out. I'll say list plant DTO all plants. Whoops, sorry, there we go. List plant DTO all plants equals new array list and then plant DTO. Okay, open and close paren and terminate with the semicolon and import anything that we need. Okay, now we are going to declare and uh, declare a variable for our DAO class that will do a lot of the networking for us, something like that. So remember something important here, uh, and that is I plant DAO. If I take a look at I plant DAO, we know this is an interface. And if I uh, control click here, we can see that it is used by, or it is implemented by a class called plant DAO stub. Now this is an important concept because we know that an interface can be realized or implemented by multiple classes. And if we make our variable type the interface type, the object type can be any class which implements that interface. This gives us a lot of flexibility, and this is an excellent case study of that, because in this case, we don't know how to do networking yet. We're going to figure that out, but we don't know yet. So we can plug in the stub that we already have, and as long as the variable is this interface type, then we can keep working on the actual implementation in this DAO here. And when this actual DAO is ready and it's talking to the network, then we can make the object type plant DAO and remove plant DAO stub as an object type. So it gives us a lot of flexibility to anticipate the future. So uh, plant DAO stub implements I plant DAO. So we do have that relationship, relationship set up correctly. Let's go back to uh, GPS a plant. And what we'll do here is we'll say I plant DAO plant DAO equals new plant DAO stub, just like so. And this is the part, do a little bit of magic entering here. This is the part where when we finish the actual implementation, we make one change there, boom, and we go from stub to implementation. It has a very minimal effect on our program. So from plant DAO, now what we can say is plant DAO, and then we can invoke the search method, and we need to pass in a string. Where are we going to get our search term string? Well, it's going to come from up here. It's going to come from the parameter that's getting passed into this method. Note one little funny thing here, and that is it's not just a string. It's a string with an ellipsis. The reason why that's funny, let me do a little pseudocode here. I could invoke this as do in background. I'm going to take this away. I just want to kind of pseudocode it out. Do in background, 
and I could pass in one string, or let's just say foo, and that would work. I could pass in two strings, foo and bar, that would work. Three strings, foo, bar, and baz, that would work as well. What's going to happen in the background is it's going to take all of these strings, make an array out of it, and pass it in where you see it here. So uh, that's a notation that just means that the Java Virtual Machine is going to make an array out of potentially multiple strings that could be passed in. So we have to make a little difference here. We'll, we'll call this one search term or search terms plural. And then what we'll do is we'll say string search term equals search terms zero. Now we really ought to check and make sure that this is not empty first because we're assuming that there is a first element that we can pull off, but nonetheless, search term zero. Then plantdao search and we'll say search term. Okay, now what does plantdao.search return? Well, let's do a control alt V and find out. Ah, oh, look at that. It returns a list of plantdao objects. So what I can do is I can say all plants equals plantdao.search, search term, and then finally return all plants. So we'll take a quick peek here at plantdao stub and let's remember what it's doing for its search term. Um, it's just doing a little contains algorithm here, it looks like, and it's a stub, so it's not a real implementation. Uh, it's just kind of a mock-up. So it has a white oak, an English oak, and an eastern redbud. Those are the three mocks that we have. Let's return to GPS of plant and finish a couple of things up. First of all, we want to uh, call this doing background method, but where are we going to call it? Well, keep in mind our use case. We want to autocomplete as the user is typing up here in this screen as I'm typing Eastern. So this is something that should be done when the activity is created. So let's go up to the onCreate method of this activity. And just a moment here. On create, and now let's start looking for plants to populate autocomplete. One note, it's widely accepted that if we're doing autocomplete, we should populate it from a local source of data. We should not reach over the internet to find the data just because of the lag time involved. So we, I, I am doing this as a demonstration, but in reality, if you are doing an autocomplete, think about having the data locally. Okay, so start looking for plants to autocomplete. So we're going to say, what was the name of our inner class? Plant search task. And plant search task equals new plant search task. So just like we're declaring any other object. Now we're going to say plant search task. And remember, we don't want to invoke do in background directly. That's not going to work for us. I could put like so. And theoretically it would work, but the problem is it won't happen in a separate thread. For do in background to actually invoke in a separate thread, we need to invoke the execute method on do in background. And then I'll just pass in something like the letter E, something that white oak, red bud, eastern red bud, each of those plants have. We can, we can tweak this a little bit later. We just want to prove out the concept of having multiple threads. So at this point, snap a breakpoint here. We know that that is going to create an object of our inner class, which is this plant search task. We know it's going to invoke execute, which is going to spawn do in background in a separate thread. Now, the other thing that we want to do is we want to watch what happens in the on post execute, and we want to confirm that we are indeed going to see the results of this uh, do in background in the on post execute. So I've set a couple of breakpoints. Let's run the debugger and see what happens. I've started my application. And so you see that we have, we're in the onCreate method, which means that the activity is still being created. If we look at the emulator, we can confirm this. Now, first thing, it's going to uh, create a new object of the plant search task. So I'm going to just do a step over and then it's going to execute the plant search task. Now, careful here, look at something interesting. Uh, first of all, we can take a look and we can see the main thread. We can see some other threads. Uh, you'll likely see a new thread come up in just a moment. Uh, similarly, if we look at frames, we can see a few thread indications right here as well. The other thing I'm going to point out is when I press F8, the debug breakpoint here will likely go to the close curly, but we're going to see another debug breakpoint uh, pick up, and that is the debug breakpoint that we have in doing background.
So let's watch. I press F8 and sure enough you see that breakpoint goes down, but it's still active, it's still blue. Uh, but now let's take a look at our threads. Oh, look at this one. Do you see there's a new thread called a sync task? That wasn't there before. I click on this and take a look. Now it shows me a separate breakpoint. So that's one of the cool things about debugging is we can debug through multiple threads simultaneously and we have the ability to flip back and forth just by clicking on this dropdown. Remember the thread called main is the thread that we're almost always debugging in unless we pick another thread. This is the UI thread. This is the thread that has the activity. A sync task is the thread that we have just created. So this is running as a separate process. So I choose F8, we do some initialization. I choose F8 again to get our plant DAO stub. I take our search term, notice it's the letter E, the letter that we passed in from the onCreate method, and now I go to perform my search. So I press F7 to step into the search and watch the tabs across the top. Remember the variable type is iPlantDAO, but the object type is plantDAO stub. If you don't fully comprehend polymorphism, uh, this will be a good time to kind of get your arms wrapped around it. If you do fully comprehend polymorphism, this will probably make a bit of sense. So I choose F7 and where do we go? We go to plant DAO stub. This is a class I made a while ago. We see it create a few objects here. And then it does a bit of math to figure out which of those objects that we create have an E and it puts those into a subset called matching plants. So I look at matching plants and let's just confirm Quercus alba, white oak, Quercus rober, English oak, Circus canadensis, eastern redbud. You see all three of these do indeed have a letter E. So we press F8, we press F8, and now it's about to return these plants. Now once again I want you to look at the threads and just remember what you see here. We're currently in async task, main still exists, so on and so forth. So I press F8. Oh, also take a look at what's above here. This dropdown tells us which thread we're in, if you didn't notice that. So async task shows us we're in async task, but I can flip back to main. I can see what's currently running in main. From there, I can flip back to async task. I want to point that out because we're going to see that it would be interesting in just a moment. But at this time, I'm all done with the async task. So when I confirm that I see async task in the thread, I'm going to choose F9, which just says continue. And where do we go back? This is where it gets really interesting. Note that another breakpoint hits, but this time the dropdown has changed and the breakpoint it's showing us is in the main method. Or sorry, the main thread, not the main method. So I'll go ahead and choose F9 on this and now what breakpoint picks up? Okay, the breakpoint picks up in the on post execute method, but once again, notice what thread that's in. It's in the main thread, not in the async task thread. Even though these two methods on post execute and do in background are in the same class, they actually operate in different threads. Do in background is where we're doing the heavy lifting and on post execute uh, is in the main thread or the UI thread. The advantage being it has access to any user interface uh, variables that were declared in our activity. That's going to be important because we're going to take this data and we're going to use it to update our autocomplete. Just for the moment though, let me just confirm if I mouse over plant DTOs, sure enough we see it has a size of three and sure enough it has three familiar plants, doesn't it? The white oak, the English oak, and the eastern redbud. So I'll go ahead and choose F9 from there. As soon as I choose F9, my screen, my screen comes back it doesn't yet have the autocomplete working, but not to worry. We'll take care of that in the next video. I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.